So the other day I was at a formal, which for those of you who don't know is a very fancy dinner at Cambridge at a particular college because yes, I have been completely indoctrinated. One of my friends who was sat next to me was trying to aggravate me and wind me up and so said, if English is a Germanic language, then why does it have so many French words? And he's got a point. There are words like beef or pork or forest with one R, that's right, because that's how it's spelt. So then why doesn't that make English a romance language if there are so many French words? In fact, there are more words of French origin in English than of a Germanic origin. Well, as I pointed out to him, just because a language, let's say any random romance language, not going to pick and choose here, borrows lots of words from Slavic languages, again, not having a specific example, does that mean that that said language in the middle of Eastern Europe, starting in R and ending in A, the middle being Romania and Romanian, does that mean that that language is Slavic? And the answer is no. But the question remains, why does English have so many French words? Well, the answer clearly lies in the Norman Conquest, which put a man called William on the English throne. Now, William Bastard. was Duke of Normandy, which today is in France. But wait a minute, I hear you say, but if he was French, then shouldn't that be Guillaume and not William? And the answer is no. No, it shouldn't be. Now, the reason why is that Yes, Guillaume is the French version of the English name William, but the language that William spoke was a particular variety of French, Norman French, and this would be very important for both the fact of the language that he spoke and the way in which it affected the English language and Middle English and by extension, modern English today. So that's what I want to explore in this video. So the Scandinavians and the people we now call Vikings who went and raided and traded and settled across the North Sea area and beyond from about the late 8th century, which is a very convoluted way of saying basically the people we call Vikings. Now the language they spoke was Old Norse in various varieties. And Old Norse, uh, when they came into contact in Normandy, as I explained in a previous video, they came into contact with a population that spoke a different language and over time this changed but let's put these two languages or multiple languages into a bit of perspective so if we try and reconstruct the Germanic languages at this time uh, we see a split between uh, there's three groups of the Germanic languages you have west north and east now Eastern Germanic languages, these were the Goths. Uh, the Goths were speaking these kind of languages. So there's several variants of Gothic in, in several places that, that went on, but that's definitely a topic for a different video. Now, normally uh, you often see it split between West, North and East, but really it's probable that East Germanic split off before and that you had a Northwestern group because they share quite a few features in common that East doesn't, but that again is for another video. But if we look at the West Germanic languages, these might be languages at the time, like Old English being spoken by the Anglo-Saxons, um, a language that I've termed Proto-Frisian because Old Frisian is the Frisian that's recorded when it's first being written down, which is quite a bit later, which is sort of 13th century, 14th century, etc. Um, other languages like Old Saxon, Old Frankish or Old Franconian, it's sometimes termed, whereas the North Germanic languages generally split into Old East Norse and Old West Norse, uh, Old East Norse being spoken in Denmark and Sweden, whereas Old West Norse was being spoken in Norway and most of the colonies that would appear throughout the North Atlantic. These are the languages that really are what we would we would call Old Norse, the two different dialects of that in a very simplistic way. Now, as I explained in my previous video about this, about the Normans and how they essentially went from being Viking or Scandinavian to being more French, they quickly assimilated with the local population. And there was a difference in the language that they originally spoke when they came, which is Old Norse, which was this North Germanic language, as I just outlined and the language being spoken by the local population, which was probably a Gallo-Romance language um, that had come out of vulgar Latin, which was being spoken that was the, the remnant of what had been spoken there uh, under the Romans that had continued. Now, there is a distinction to be made between this language and Old Franconian, which is the ancestor language of languages like Dutch, for example, um, which is the language being spoken by the Franks, but the Franks never actually got the local population on uh, in the countryside to speak this language. That's why French is obviously a Romance language and not a Germanic language, even though it's from Frankish and the Franks were a Germanic people. 
if you can follow that. So let's now take a look at the Romance languages and where they kind of fit in during this period. Now this is all very loose because of course, you know, you can make a lovely chart and a tree of languages, but of course, languages are very fluid and dynamic and it's really difficult to pinpoint them exactly, but this is just a brief overview from what I've seen. So the Ibero Romance tree, this is what's being spoken in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, this period you probably have a, uh, a, a common group of Galician and Portuguese. Obviously today these are two different languages, but they ultimately come from the same root. You have the ancestor of modern Spanish, Old Castilian, and as well in the north you have the Asturian and Leonese and many other varieties being spoken. Now at this time actually there's no real distinction between Occitan and Catalan. In fact these words are being used interchangeably at this point and they only start to separate sort of a few hundred years later. Um, Although it's this branch, the Gallo-Romance branch, that is of particular interest for us with Old uh, Norman. Because you have this term which is Old French, but really you have lots of dialects, you know, some would call them sub-languages or regional languages, which are Gallo-Romance in what's now France, and these include sort of Picard, Gallo, and Old Norman as well. I've put Old Norman because Norman is actually a language today or a dialect today, depending on who you ask. But these kind of all fall under the branch of Old French. Modern French really comes from the Parisian dialect of French that eventually became the dominant form throughout Northern France and then later the rest of France. But at this time you have lots of regional dialects and Old Norman really is one of those, but it has some special quirks to it, which I'm about to get into. And you know, another branch that I included there is Italo-Dalmatian, so this is being spoken in the um, Italian peninsula uh, and there you have late vulgar Latin which is essentially the extension of Latin where where it's vulgar Latin but then you have sound shifts making it late vulgar Latin and this obviously then develops into what's now Italian. So what about the Norman French language then? What is it? Because of course the Vikings and Scandinavians that come first are speaking Old Norse, they then enter into this Gallo-Romance population. What do we get out of this big mixture? Well, it also depends where you look. As I mentioned in the previous video, the Côte d'Etang Peninsula was very heavily settled by Scandinavians, so there was probably more Old Norse and for longer being spoken there. Whereas in other parts of the duchy, it was quite light Scandinavian settlement, so we only find some words. Now, there is clearly an Old Norse influence on the Gallo-Romance language, the Old French dialect that's being spoken in Normandy. And we see it in place names like these, as I explained in the previous video. These are clearly Old Norse place names that are uh, coming into the language. But we also get a lot of loan words. Now, a loan word is a word that you take from another language uh, and then you, you add it into yours. So, for example, the word pizza is an Italian word, but it's also now a word that is commonly used in English because, well, you know, we, we like pizza. So for the French language, this is important, the Norman French language, and actually a lot of these came into English as well through Old Norse, or that it had an Old English cognate, so that it was already in the Old English language and therefore has come into Modern English, or others that have directly come in from Old Norse. So these are words uh, like bait from beta in Old Norse, like down from du Holmer, Hauger, Malver, Mjuk, and Fik. These are all words, some of which have come into English, some only in dialect. So in the north, if it's quite kind of misty, wet weather, you might say it's muggy. Well, this is from Mjuk, which is the Old Norse. And then you have Mukhe in the Norman French, which is quite interesting. Again, you have Hauger, which uh, hasn't made it into the English language uh, so much, but then you have Og. And my normal French is really terrible. I mean, my normal French pronunciation is, is bad enough, so I'm not sure how good my normal French would be. Um, but I believe it is Hogue in uh, normal French because the, the H is actually still pronounced or was in Old Norman at the time. Uh, as well as in, in place names, uh, you get the Viket you get from Vik, which you know is a possible etymology of, of Viking. So in 1066, this becomes important for the English language because, of course, this is the date in which the Normans defeat the Anglo-Saxons under Harold Godwinson and take over England starting the Norman period. And this is when we get the language of the Normans being introduced with the aristocracy and eventually this diffuses out into the local English language and will have an effect on Middle English and the later English to follow. And it's important then that this was Norman French that was being spoken rather than a different variety of French. And this has left several uh, traces on the English language, especially on those loan words that were borrowed from Norman French into English. 
Now, one of the reasons why is that Norman French, unlike other forms of French, did have an aspirated H and a K. So that's a H and a K. You're putting air behind those sounds to make him. Whereas if you know some French, you'll know that the H is normally silent at the start of a word. For old Norman French, this wasn't the case. So we see interesting things. We also see with uh, old Norman French that the it was a preferred sound was the C uh, rather than the CH in French. Obviously, the CH in English would be CH. But in from French, it becomes sure sure like in Champagne. Whereas for the Normans, this wasn't necessarily the case. So this has left some interesting traces. In English, we have cabbage from cabouche rather than from choux. Now, castle is an interesting one. This is from Castel. And Castel actually came into Norman French through Occitan, which is from a different branch of the Romance languages. This was spoken in very large parts of the south of France and into parts of Spain, and still is uh, by certain people. And this is why we have castle in English rather than the French sound de cheux in château which I think is a really interesting development. Otherwise, we could have had a chassel or something like this. But because it was Norman French, we got this, this, this actually, this loan word from Occitan and got castle instead, which is a really Norman word when you think about the Normans coming and building castles. Another change, which is very interesting, is that Norman French retained the uh, the w sound rather than the g in French, and this possibly has something to do with Old Norse influence as well, um, although I'm not too sure about that. So we see this in a lot of words like war uh, and warrior. We get uh, in French you get guerre and guerrier, whereas in Norman French you get verre and verreur. So these are very different words, and this is also why you get uh, William in uh, Norman French and William then in English and not Guillaume because. The W is retained in Norman French, whereas in other forms of French, this is not the case. So that's why you get Guillaume. And there's lots of examples for this. That's why in English, uh, Wales is with a W, but it's uh, Pays de Galles in French. You get this all the time. It's, it's actually a very interesting shift that I, I was first pointed out to me in high, sc in, uh, high school, yes, by uh, my French teacher. And I sort of stopped and thought, oh, wow, I wonder why that is. And finally coming to make a video about it. Now, as I, as I referenced sort of throughout this video, the Norman language, and I, I try to call it Old Norman in this video, or Old Norman French, is actually still spoken today in parts of Normandy as well as the Channel Islands. But I think I need to make a separate video about that to give the modern language, uh, you know, the video that it deserves, the attention that it deserves. But this is essentially just a video uh, made about the Norman language. As I said, I'd, I'd look into that and I have the other video about the Normans uh, on there. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's been a bit all over the place, but apparently you people like that, which I'm completely fine with because I love just sort of sitting behind a computer and talking about these language things, just little things that I learned um, and, and I hope that you guys did enjoy that. So this all came because I was sat next to my friend Rob at Formal and he was trying to wind me up. We always have conversations like this about history and languages, but if you couldn't guess, he's Romanian and Romanian has an awful lot of Slavic words in it, but Romanians are ardently and, and proudly the, the last bastion of the Roman Empire in Eastern Europe, and so they, they cling to their Romance roots very proudly, very strongly, um, which is why I added that to the introduction. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. I have been Hilbert, and this has been The History slash Linguistics. See you soon.